So this is the <coughs> last class before we begin a series of conversations with visitors. Uh, throughout this course, we are attempting to maintain an interplay, a dialectic between interpretation of the American past mm -hmm. and imagination of the American future. Uh, and in that spirit, we want to devote today's class to a conversation between the two of us and with you about the general contours of an American alternative. And we're going to do it this way. We're going to go in uh, something like 10 steps. Uh, at each step, I'm going to state in a couple of minutes a few propositions just to provoke our conversation. Cornell will respond. And then we'll open it up at each step for just a couple of questions or interventions by you. We have to limit the engagement at each step in order to be able to execute this plan and in the hope of preserving time at the end for a general discussion. So first, what kind of an alternative do we need? Uh, it should be an alternative with at least the following characteristics. First of all, it should deal with structure, and in particular with the institutional arrangements of the country especially those arrangements that influence the primary or fundamental distribution of advantage and opportunity, as opposed to simply shaping a retrospective distribution achieved through progressive taxation and social entitlements. And insofar as it is an economic program, a program in political economy, it should deal with the supply side of the economy and not just with the demand side. Second, it should be a project that has in mind the transformation of consciousness as well as the transformation of institutions. Every deep change in history must involve both institutional innovation and innovation in our beliefs in our assumptions. And third, it must be the reverse side, the counterpart to a transracial progressive majority in the country. The kind of project that could help build such a majority and that would in turn be supported by it. So it cannot be a project narrowly based just on some particular segment of the labor force, mm -hmm. such as organized industrial workers headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy. It must be open to all the groups that sustain uh, the interests of workers and producers. And that must include, in principle, the small business class that plays such an important role in the country. The European left in the past two centuries made the fatal mistake of electing the petty bourgeoisie, the small business class, as its enemy. And the result was that this class then became the mainstay of the right-wing movement in 20th century European history. If we define the petty bourgeoisie subjectively rather than objectively by a horizon of aspiration rather than by the possession of assets, it is in some sense now the majority of humanity throughout the world as well as in the United States. And it's no good to formulate a project that is antagonistic to them and that is unable to meet them on their own terms. And against whom is this majority? Against the rentiers and the plutocrats. Cornell. Mm, mm. 
First, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> That's an aspect of consciousness in terms of the, uh, where we are in the history of this very fragile democratic experiment in the history of the American empire. When we think about the structural issues, though, I think first and foremost, I look at it through the lens of how do we learn how to democratize in an improvisational way. The democratizing of the nation state, the democratizing of the economy, the democratizing of the culture industry. And improvisational meaning that usually is going to be a hybrid affair. That is to say, sometimes it's going to be public sector only, sometimes it'll be private sector only, sometimes it'll be a combination of public and private. But again, as you know, I begin with the, the note of empire, the militarism that needs to be the object of fundamental structural transformation. The military industrial complex, the national security state, the national surveillance state. And here I, I, I sound a little bit like my libertarian brothers and sisters, you see. Without an intense fight for rights and liberties, the right to dissent, the right to engage in public conversation, the authoritarianism will, will suffocate any possible talk about structural transformation. And that's very real. Because when you talk about militarism abroad and the imperial policies, the 4,800 or so military units around, uh, around the world, and 587 outside of the United States, the 50, 56 cent, every dollar we've talked about over and over again in this class going to the military industrial conflict, that can't be a silent assumption that we fail to interrogate. That's got to be part and parcel of how we understand structural transformation. And similarly so in terms of militarism at home, from police departments, you see, repressive apparatuses at work, the FBI keeping track of both of us, for example, which is fine. That's a compliment. <laughs> no, I want the FBI to know that's a compliment. <laughs> I must be doing something right. But they, they're infiltrating the, the Ku Klux Klan, too, so I shouldn't get too excited about that. <laughs> But this is very real, because when we're talking about American democracy, we're talking about all of its various aspects and facets that must be radically interrogated from a radical democratic point of view. You see. Same would be true uh, in terms of the economy. And we're going to get to this. You know. How do we learn how to think improvisationally, undogmatically, in such a way that the fundamental aim is the deep commitment to the dignity of everyday people, that their voices can be heard and that their lives can flower and flourish? So it's not going to be just a matter of calling for redistribution in some orthodox way. But it's going to be a matter of trying to ensure everyday people have access to resources. So it includes redistribution, but it's got to be thought and rethought in such a way that ordinary people actually have some access to those resources. And this is a very difficult thing to think through because in neoliberal ways, you got NGOs, you got charity, you got arrogant, condescending, uh, paternalistic policies so that the elites in those institutions end up getting most of the resources, but the institutions are dedicated to providing resources to those on the ground. There's a long history of that, you see. So we have to be very, very Socratic in that regard, questioning, interrogating. Uh, uh, let me stop there and open it up, because we don't want to go on and on. Any interventions right quick? And interventions can be propositions. Yeah, propositions too. Questions. That's true. If not, I'll go on. No, it's, <laughs> same is true in terms of the nation state. What happens when you have a nation state that has a disproportionate amount of power, power, highly centralized power? How do you democratize that power? How do you decentralize that power? And right wing folk who talk about federalism have no monopoly on having suspicions of a nation state that has a disproportionate amount of power. That's a very dangerous thing. That's what I love about my anarchist comrades. They say, show me a nation state that has a monopoly on its instrumentalities of violence, and I'll show you a repressive nation state or a despotism in the making. 
that goes from Proudhon to Noam Chomsky, all anarchists. You don't have to be an anarchist to recognize the challenge. But the same would be true, of course, in the economy with the oligarch, with, with the monopolies and the oligopolies. And the unbelievable concentration of power that's, for the most part, unaccountable. How do we maintain a radical democratic perspective that keeps track of both of those sites where you have unbelievable concentration of power, for the most part, unanswerable? So let me go on to the second proposition and see if it provokes a, a response. Sure, sure. Uh, so the transformation of consciousness. I return to the argument in our first class. The American prophecy, the message is the divine power within, the power of transcendence. We're not as small as we seem to be. The central democratic idea is faith in the constructive genius of ordinary men and women. But this American prophecy has been subject to two taints that must be removed. And this is then, on the view that I'm defending, the beginning of the necessary transformation of consciousness. The first is we have to overcome the disturbed, inadequate recognition of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. Solidarity, the others, that's part of self-construction. It's not something that comes afterwards and that we can make rest solely on the basis of voluntary association. And the second taint resting on this American prophecy is what I call the institutional idolatry. The idea that the United States has already discovered the definitive formula of a free society in its economic and political institutions. And what is necessary, according to this view, is to trade in some bad American exceptionalism for some good American experimentalism and to organize a practice that innovates not just one time, but in an ongoing fashion in the economic and political institutions to the end of democratizing the market and deepening democracy. Hmm. You know, it was interesting when we started off, we talked about an interpretation of the past and a vision for the future. But we know that also presupposes us a certain analysis of the present. What is incipient in the present that can allow us to accent, on the, accent the best of the past in order to forge a concrete alternative, democratic, radically democratic alternative? And I think in, in looking very briefly at the present, uh, one of the things in regard to what you just said has to do with the acknowledgment of the ways in which the American experiment is like any other experiment in the sense that it's a human one. And any time you get a human one, you're going to have the constants in the human condition, which is greed, hatred, fear, and how you come to terms with those three. You see. So you got to keep track of the greed in all of us, but especially the greed of those at the top who can get away with impunity and immunity as other, focus, uh, other people are suffering. And that top has a number of different forms. But the same is true. So, so the issue of corruption, fundamental. That's true for every government we know. Asia, Africa, Latin America, indigenous peoples. Wherever you go, you get human beings, you're going to have to have mechanisms to keep track of corruption. We're living at a time in which the corruption is running amok. Greed is running amok. Hatred increasing and the fear being manipulated. So how then do we talk about the ways in which we can change consciousness in such a grim moment? That has to do with our, our present. And if we're unable to come to terms with countervailing forces against those, then all the talk about alternatives are going to be fairly empty. You see. So that if, for example, when you look at the culture industry of our predatory capitalist moment, and you see 
the proliferation of hardened hearts of consumers and the coarse and conscious of persons who have tremendous difficulty being citizens. And the very notion of being a citizen is secondary or tertiary. You can't have a democracy without citizens. You can have predatory capitalism with, with consumers. But you can have a neo-fascist capitalism. You can have a democratic capitalism. You can have a radical democratic alternative to neoliberal capitalism. But these are issues of consciousness, what I call the, the existential and the psychic, that have a lot to do with the quality of the civic associations. That's why, of course, the Tocqueville is so important. Of education, of church, mosque, synagogue, trade union, and media, social media, corporate media, alternative media like Amy Goodman and others. Let's open it up. Yes, my dear brother. Good question. This is consciousness is the is the representation of social life, our our interpretation of social life, in which our understanding of our interests meets our understanding of our ideals. So I made this remark in an earlier class. Our interests and ideals are always nailed to the cross of our institutions and practices. Our institutions and practices are never just material things like part of the furniture of the universe. Uh, they have a representational element. They, for them to exist and to be reproduced, they require to be enveloped in a world of ideas and of assumptions about our interests and our ideals. That's consciousness. It's that marriage of our understanding of our ideals and our interests to the institutions and practices society. It's this world of assumption that envelops the structure. Mm -hmm. And I would just say it's ways of life and modes of being. The structures of value and the structures of feeling. There's dominant forms of that. There's residual forms of that. There's oppositional forms of that. But for example, in our own day, tied to the consumerism, usually is a certain highly clever strat strategy of those who sell commodities to convince us to be seduced by their weapons of mass distraction. So the things that matter, joy, justice, democracy, push to the margin. And what is presented is instant gratification, ephemeral commodities, learning how to be a master at making it as opposed to keeping faith. That's professionalism, you see. How do I get through my career? What kind of calling you got? Well, I haven't thought about that too much because I don't have time to think about it because I gotta, I gotta make it. Yes, it's true. But that's part of the culture, you see. The culture of higher education, the culture of our entertainment industry, we saw it with grammar, the culture of our religious life, the consciousness of our universities and religious institutions and civic, that, that's in part what, what we have in mind. And I think it, it overlaps in terms of our understanding of that. Yes, question. Yes. 
your imagination, do you see President Obama going um, to prison because of the crime that he's done, or President Bush because of the crime that he has done? And attached to that then uh, comes your question, well, how is that possible with America's um, love for um, its founding father and its president? Or its refusal to render its highest elected officials legally and morally accountable. So it's a moral issue, it's a legal issue. It's hard to enforce it legally because the international courts don't have the power to bring to bear the kinds of crimes committed by any of the elected officials at the top of the major empires. U.S. empire, Chinese empire, Brits, French, and so forth and so on. You see. It's no accident that most of the folk who've been brought to international court when they're elected officials are from where? The vast majority from Africa. You say, now how in the God's heaven are African presidents going to have a monopoly on war crimes? You got war criminals in Africa, you got war criminals in America, you got war criminals in Russia, you got war criminals in India, you got war criminals across the board, but they all tend to be... Well, it gives you an idea of the imbalance of power vis-a-vis -vis international institutions. International institutions are going to reflect the imperial, imperial powers in place. The UN, World Bank, IIF, and so forth and so on. You see. And so, yes, on the moral issue, and this is why the, we, what we've been stressing so much, this issue of, of democratic moral witness, you see. That if, if Bush is dropping 45 drones, and they know, in fact, that the collateral damage are innocent people. I consider those war crimes, but I believe they, they ought to have a trial. If Obama dropped 547, which he did, then he has to be accountable. If you're having the killer meetings on Tuesday mornings to decide who you're going to kill, and you, de you decide to kill an American citizen and his son, that's wrong. They need to have a trial. I don't care what their ideology is. So you don't go around killing members of the Ku Klux Klan just because you disagree with them. If they engage in injurious harm, they have a trial. You see, that is imperial presidencies. An imperial president beyond the law and most importantly with no moral accountability. So I mean that's just one example among others. But it's the question of trying to keep alive the health of a democracy. If you want an emperor, that's a different thing. The emperor does what he or she wants to do. That's their will. They don't look to the will of the people. If you want a president in a democratic arrangement, there has to be some separation of powers that allow accountability. But of course, when you say that, you get accused of name calling and personalizing and so forth and so on. But this is very important to the consciousness and the culture of a democracy, be it a developing country of South Africa or be it the United States that's been around for over 200 years and is in deep decay and decline right now, but it can bounce back. Next. We have to go on. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, then we'll, yeah right, that, that's right, that's right, that's right. Now we're gonna begin a series of propositions about the economy. So the third proposition is, about the most advanced practice of production that has emerged in the United States and in all the other major economies of the world. There is a revolutionary practice of production. We call it the new economy, the experimentalist economy, the knowledge economy. Dense in knowledge and technology and dedicated to permanent innovation. It brings together the activity of producing things, goods and services, and the activity of discovering things. <coughs> and it makes the activity of production resemble more closely the practice of the imagination and the evolution of science. It has vast potential. But this potential mm -hmm. is squandered because this knowledge economy remains confined in islands. It is an insular vanguardism that excludes the vast majority of workers and of businesses and consigns a large part of the labor force increasingly to what amounts in practice to some kind of make work. 
Uh, so what do we want? We want to overcome piece by piece or step by step this vast hierarchical segmentation of the economy. This radical chasm between the advanced and the backward parts of production. Now, how are we to do mm -hmm. that? Throughout these propositions, I am going to emphasize as example steps that are very close, the practical, and steps that are very far away, called utopian. But in fact, marking a direction rather than the middle level, which I have emphasized mm. in our mm. previous mm. classes. So where might we begin? Here's an example. We might develop for all parts of the economy the equivalent to agricultural extension. Uh, the Americans organized in the first half of the 19th century, uh, astonishingly efficient new form of agriculture of a family scale, and a, a collaboration of the government with the family farmers using, among other things, the land-grant colleges. Agricultural extension, a, a, a program of uplift of the producer in the backward parts of the economy to give him access not just to credit and technology, but to more advanced practice and knowledge. Uh, now, far into the future, what do we want in this knowledge economy for the many, this radicalized and disseminated form of the knowledge economy? We want an economy in which no human being will be condemned to work as if he were a machine. The machine will do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat. And it will help us preserve our time for the not yet repeatable. And this combination of the machine and the anti-machine, the human being, will be much more powerful than either of them separately. And thus, the, we will be in a situation in which Instead of just aspiring to freedom from the economy through the overcoming of scarcity, we will be able to hope for freedom in the economy. The economy will cease to be simply a terrain of constraint and will become also a setting of liberation. No, I say uh, yes. <laughs> no, indeed, indeed. See, my hunch is, though, in order to be able to do that kind of democratizing, keep in mind it's the same democratizing theme that we've been talking about. Uh, but I think in addition, I mean, we're living under conditions of globalizing financial capitalism in which the banks are in, in the vanguard in terms of power, wealth, influence. When I was growing up, when I was the age of most of you all, it was much more under industrial conditions. So it was American Motors and, and major corporations that produce things. Now the major folk don't produce things. They produce deals with billions of dollars at stake. It's a very different kind of moment under a globalizing capitalism. It's financial. So it's Wall Street, so it's banks. And so even as we democratize in the way that you're talking about, somehow we've got to come up with democratizing the oligarchs and plutocrats of our day, which is primarily financial elite. And it's no accident that there's been this massive redistribution of wealth from poor and working people to the top 1% that, that others have talked about in the last 20, 25 years, you see. There has to be some way of democratizing first the culture. How do you get at the stakeholders and the shareholders? It can't just be the same elite. And most importantly, how do you get some democratic accountability of the banks themselves? Now you got Sister Elizabeth Warren, Brother Bernie Sanders, and others saying, well, let's, let's, let's have a wealth tax. Let's have tax on the financial transition, transactions of the banks. Well, that's a, that's a, a kind of move in that direction, but we'll see that's still going to be radic radically inadequate. And that policy is, view is viewed as some kind of far-left communist move. You think, well, what? my 
Hmm? Louder. Yeah. Well, he had the Federal Reserve, but he gave the money to who? Not the homeowners, yes. not the working classes, not the poor people. They got trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, most of it near zero interest rate, as opposed to students still had to pay interest. You see what I mean? Yes. Treat your students like you treat Wall Street. That's a radical notion. <laughs> Make their interest rate almost zero, year after year after year. But keep in mind, let's be true to FDR now. FDR's tax rates would make Sister AOC look like a centrist. <laughs> she called for 70, he had 90. That's a certain kind of robust liberalism. It wasn't socialism. John Dewey, Norman Thomas, they were socialists. They were against FBR. FDR, you're not going far enough. He said, no, I understand your moral challenge, but I'm trying to run things but I'm going to bring tremendous weight of the state in the form of taxation. And of course, during the war, you can have patriotic appeals, you can have appeals to nationalism, and people are willing to sacrifice, and after the war is over, they want to go back to business as usual. So in that sense, even when we talk about liberalism, we want to be very specific, which particular forms, which particular policies, and so forth and so on. That's why, I mean, Bernie Sanders ran basically on a, a New Deal liberalism the last time he ran for president. He didn't run on the socialism at all. But we're trying to talk about something that's different. It's not just taxation. We're going to get to that in terms of we talk about the economy. But ways in which you, you actually attempt to be a bit more improvisational in getting at some of the sources of wealth even prior to the taxation setting in. But any other quick comments before we, uh, before you go? Don't hesitate. Yes. Yes. That's right. In the U.S., has that ever been done though, without there being some sort of like disaster? Because like during FDR's age, not only did you have the Great Depression, but you had like World War II. So That's like right. The military apparatus employed so many people, so people were willing to like pay those taxes and give more power to the state. But would our culture and otherwise like peaceful times allow us to have that restructuring? But, but let, let me answer that. It's a good question. I, I'm very careful to distinguish the proximate steps from the distant one. I'm not evoking the traditional 19th century Marxist idea of a sudden systemic change. There are these systems, indivisible packages like capitalism and socialism and suddenly we replace one system by another. No. So that's why the initial example I gave was in a way very modest. The example of a counterpart in industry and in services to agricultural extension. There's nothing on its face revolutionary about that or nothing that lies beyond the horizon of what's feasible. The question is the direction. What's the sequence of steps that, uh, that allows us to imagine getting from there to here. And the crucial methodological point is to combine the method of fragmentary, gradual, and cumulative change with the aspiration of fundamental change against our habits of mind, because we associate the fragmentary and the gradual with the superficial. And Mm, and mm. the radical with the totalistic. That's what gets us to your problem. And it's that method that I'm rejecting. Mm -hmm. well, that's an important point. Just very quickly, can I just answer this? Because I think one of the things we've talked about in the very part, early part of this class was how these various catastrophes take on different forms. So when I hear you say peaceful times, peaceful for who? You see? One out of two of them. 
children in America who are black and brown living in poverty. That's not peaceful times. That's catastrophe. A war might be catastrophe for the whole nation, but there's catastrophes taking place within the nation that we're silent about. If you go in these decrepit schools in the hood where there's wars going on, that's catastrophe. It's not peaceful. It's peaceful for the ruling classes until they, there's a threat, you see. But there, there's not enough connection with what's going on in other parts of the country, you see what I mean? Domestic violence, that's catastrophe. You see? Stagnating wages, that's catastrophe. So it depends the lens through which. This is why the legacy of Jerusalem is so important. Can you look at the world through the lens of the fatherless, motherless, oppressed, persecuted, subjugated ones, you see? So as long as it's peaceful only for those folk who are ruling and for the middle classes that are able to get by and live in gated neighborhoods and what have you, then you're not going to get that sense of urgency. But you're so right that usually it's some perception of a catastrophe, some perception of a crisis, like depression hits everybody. It's almost 55% of the country living in poverty. I think we have a social problem. <laughs> you don't say, because it's a threat for the most part to those who rule. They can't reproduce their order at that level. Well, we get it down to 25%. Now we're back to normal times. 25 is still too much. Healthcare the same way. Well, we added 20 million. How many are still dangling? 19 million. That's, that's catastrophic to live your life with no health care. And the only way you get it is through some profiteering insurance and pharmaceutical company. It's not a right, it's a privilege, even steal. So those are the kind of challenges that we have to wrestle with. You see what I'm saying? I'm not coming at you personally, but it's just this larger framework, you see. Because radical de democratic visions of a, of, 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 of a different world has to do with consciousness. The lens through which you look at your democracy, you, the, the plight of all of your citizens, well-to-do, middle-class, working-class, white, red, brown, yellow, physically challenged, gay, lesbian, trans, whatever, you see. There was, there was a hand, I think, briefly here. And then, then we had, yeah, right here. Um, so, what, how would you respond to Derek Bell's idea of American conversion? So, like with World War II, you have the ruling classes saying, oh, wow, well, this is existential, existential threat to us, too. So, we're going to do some of the things that we want. Great Depression, like you said. Mm -hmm. Because no, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's because there are always two sets of ways of defining and defending group or class interests. There's always one set of ways which is institutionally conservative and socially exclusive. So it assumes the present structure, the present order of production, and it defines the groups in the neighboring space as the rivals as the enemy. So for example, the industrial mm. workers in declining mass production industry in the Rust Belt say, the other classes close to us are our adversaries. And we're going to build into this niche and defend it against the temporary workers, the subcontracted workers, the small business class. And we're going to seek protection and subsidies. The problem is that this industry has no future. So all they're doing is buying a few more years. There, there's no prospect. Now, but there's another way of defining and defending the group interest, which is socially solidaristic or inclusive and institutionally transformative. And then those same workers say, this has no future. So we need to imagine the conversion of mass production industry into something else. And to that end, we need a broader coalition, an alliance. 
And those people whom we thought of as our enemies need to become our allies. And that, and then embark on another trajectory. That's what always happens. So of course the problem is that the first option is the most tangible because it's, it's what exists. And the second is much more promising, but intangible. So somehow, politics and thought, imagination, have to come to the rescue. And to compensate for the intangibility of the other option. That seems to me to be the fundamental answer to your, to your concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw another hand just quickly. Yes, Mr. Brown. Yeah, one, one left. Ooh, in the back, we don't want to discriminate against those sitting way in the back either, though. But you go right ahead. Yeah. The fear of the fear of which? The fear of having no job at all? The fear of losing that work and giving it over to the machine. Well, of course, because because it appears now that this technological advance could result simply in joblessness. Uh, the the orthodox belief in economics here it's not a heresy; it's the orthodoxy is that there is no so-called lump sum of labor, and that technological evolution destroys some form of employment and creates others, but not automatically. That, that requires some structural conversion, and which has to have as its counterpart a new kind of education, for example. So it's this, it's this process. But the, 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 the great economic and spiritual value at stake is this idea that we have an interest in, in being productive agents, not at the cost of turning ourselves into machines. Uh, and because mm, then, mm. then the ascent of productivity coincides with an ascent of empowerment. That's emancipation. That's what we want. We want to move in this area of intersection between the conditions of material progress and the conditions of our emancipation. Let's just have one because we yes. haven't had a, anybody from way in the back. I saw a hand way back there. That wasn't a hand. Just stretching out. Oh, that's good. You go. Yeah, we got two or three seats here up here too. Please don't hesitate. Oh no, seat over here too. Absolutely. Okay, next proposition, though, bro. The fourth proposition. Yeah, number four. Number four. Fourth proposition. <laughs> the relation between capital and labor. Mm. So, a, a parallel development, parallel to the, the rise of this insular form of the knowledge economy, is the, the abandonment of an increasing part of the labor force to precarious employment. So, the standard form of employment under mass production was the assembly of a stable labor force in large productive units. Now we have work increasingly organized around the world through decentralized and unstable networks of contractual arrangements. Imposed by this imperative of flexibility in the new economy. But how can we prevent flexibility from turning into radical economic insecurity? We can't, by decree, abolish these new practices and relations of production, but we need not allow them to produce a universal economic disempowerment. And therefore, in the proximate step, we need to create a new body of law to master this economic reality. And you can imagine the beginning of this body of law as a kind of sliding scale. 
We use all the available technologies of communication to help organize and represent those precarious workers. But to the extent that they are not organized and represented, we provide for direct legal intervention in the employment relation. For example, we impose price neutrality in the relation between stable and unstable employment that is analogous. So we say uh, the employer must pay the unstable employee at least as much as is paid for the equivalent stable form of employment of doing that same activity. And in this way, we prevent flexibility from serving as a pretext for insecurity. Now, that's just the beginning, an example. And if we look far ahead into the future, what do we want? We want the defective forms of free labor to give way to the higher forms of free labor. The defective form of free labor is economically dependent wage labor, recognized by all of the liberals and socialists in the 19th century as a continuation of slavery and serfdom. It wasn't just Karl Marx. It was Abraham Lincoln or John Stuart Mill. They said, this is not free labor. This is a transit. What are the higher forms of free labor? Self-employment and cooperation. Real self-employment, not self-employment as a disguised form of wage labor as in the circumstance of the Uber driver. Uh, and of course, the overcoming of wage labor by the combination of cooperation and self-employment requires radical innovation in the regime of property, in the terms of access to productive resources and opportunity, the object of the next proposition. Mm, mm, mm. And I think it's here where the, um, the tradition of Karl Marx and W.B. Du Bois and Angela Davis and others accent the ways in which the asymmetric relation of capital and labor at the workplace is anti-democratic. If you're concerned about democratizing, you don't have to be a communist or a Marxist, but you have to come to terms with the insights of that tradition, you see, then you either accept that anti-democratic character or recognize they will be exploited, dominated, and there must be security from exploitation and domination for a person to flower and flourish. And that was not just overlooked, but America has never, for the most part, come to terms with that. And it's precisely because we have such a profound, uncritical acceptance of not just private property in the abstract, but refusal to come to terms with the dynamics between laborers and capital at the workplace. At the workplace. We've allowed, we can see this in the history of American law, you can, we've allowed corporate elites to act as if the only way they can be free is to include the right to freely exploit their workers. In the same way the Confederacy, in the Constitution, we are a freedom movement. That's what Alexander Stevens, the Vice President, that's what Jefferson, we are a freedom movement. We must have the freedom to keep these black people in slavery in perpetuity. And we have to be able to think to see why they would say such a thing. Because they're coming out of a country where they get, they're free to use their property any way they want, and these people are property. So like in, in, in Beloved by Tony Morrison, if a mother kills her baby and they're both slaves, that's one piece of property killing another piece of property. It doesn't rise to the level of legal murder. So she gets persecuted and convicted for what? For running away from the South because you don't recognize the human value that precious black baby beloved that Seth engages in. Well, there is a, an extension of this sense of slavery by other means at the workplace that we've yet to come to terms with. 
And it's no accident that we've had such vast inequality. The Gilded Age that Mark Twain talked about, that we re referred to in this class, and now the second Gilded Age that we're living in right now under very different economic, technological, political circumstances, but same levels of wealth inequality with unbelievable, uh, almost unbearable levels of social misery and socially induced forms of suffering that hardly surface in our public discourse because it's so truncated in terms of the voices that are allowed to be heard in public dialogues between right-wing, cold-hearted Fox News and milquetoast MSNBC, <laughs> that neoliberal, spineless kind of discourse. It can't wait to feel good about itself, that liberal, self-righteous, well, I better, I better, I better cut button. <laughs> Questions, comments, reflections. <laughs> we're, we're, start, we're starting in the back. How, how are we doing with gender balance, though? Have we had a system? Yeah, go right ahead, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah. But religion is also been a tool one for oppression. Absolutely. It's also a huge economic uh, demand, especially on people who use faith and are from sort of lower economic perspectives and are it's more common among those in that oppressed position. So if faith has a role in expanding consciousness, how do we take the oppressive nature out of faith and how do we get the economic uh, incentives of faith, the economic involvement of faith institutions to be productive rather than demanding and harmful? Mm, wonderful question. Well, as I said before, now we got greed, we got hatred, and we got various forms of fear shot through every institution, including churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and so on, and universities. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we can't eliminate it because you can't eliminate human beings unless we just let the whole thing go and leave it to the cockroaches, <laughs> which is a possibility of nuclear catastrophe, right? So then the question becomes, how do we accent those rich prophetic and democratic possibilities that are inherent in various religious traditions across the board, but recognize that most of the institutional forms of religion tend to accommodate themselves to a reigning status quo, whatever it is. Under slavery, you're going to get the vast majority usually of institutional religion to accommodate itself to slavery. Right. Under vicious communist rule, you're going to get a Russian Orthodox church that accommodates itself to a gangster named Stalin. Hitler, where would the churches stand on Hitler? Vast majority went fascist and Nazi. You had a confessing church, and you could fit the leaders of the confessing church in this room, in Germany. So we can go on and on and on. That's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of primates we are. So then the question becomes, how do we accent that prophetic God bless you, prophetic sense of possibility. And that's always a slice all the time in any context, you know. Will most of the professors at Harvard accommodate themselves to the status quo, whatever the reigning status quo is, to the degree to which their careers will flower and flourish? Hell yes. <laughs> I mean, I understand it. They're human beings. But not all of them. Not all of them. And the students exposed to all of them then you have to choose when you move into your institutional setting. What kind of vision, what kind of courage, what kind of risk, what kind of sacrifice, what kind of over-againstness will one have vis-a-vis -vis what is in, in place? But the last thing you want to do is just look at religion as a homogeneous blob and say, oh my God, all of that vicious imperial sensibility and racism, sexism, homophobia, and so forth, the anti-Jewish, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian elements shot through these institutional religious, instit religious practices, do you just give up with, on those institutions as a whole? No, you got to work with what you got. You got to work with what you got. And sometimes they will surprise you. Sometimes it, they change their minds. You see, sometimes people undergo consciousness raising. They get radicalized, they get democratized in that way. So that's the beginning of an answer to your question, but I think it's so very important because the United States is probably one of the most religiously saturated of all empires. It's the most market-driven and it's the most religiously saturated at the same time. See, that's a hell of a juxtaposition. It's a hell of a juxtaposition. Do you wanna? <laughs> 
fifth proposition. Number five. We're doing all right. It's just 205. Oh, we're doing fine. Oh, we got a nice flow we'll going. Time. We got a nice flow going. Yeah. So, fifth proposition, <laughs> finance and the real economy. Yes, yes. Or finance and production. So under the current arrangements, the production system largely finances itself on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. What then is the point of all that money in the banks and the stock markets? It's theoretically to finance the productive agenda of society. Most of it has only an episodic or oblique relation to this productive agenda. Finance is indifferent to the real economy in good times and destructive in bad times. Mm -hmm. And the most important activity, which is the funding of the production of new assets in new ways, represents a minuscule part of the activity of the capital markets. So what do we want? As a proximate measure, we want to replace financial hypertrophy by financial deepening. That is to say, mm. to tighten the link between finance and the real economy. To make finance a good servant rather than allowing it to be a bad master. Uh, and then we can do that through a series of negative and positive measures. The negative measures would discourage or prohibit financial activity that has no plausible relation to the expansion of output or the enhancement of productivity. For example, uh, options contracts, derivative contracts, that were justified at the inception in commodity markets as a basis for the creation of liquidity may have no such justification when transposed to equity markets and so forth. And positive measures in tapping the latent productive potential of vast amounts of capital that are, for example, caught in the pension, public and private pension systems of the world, using the powers of government to mimic the undone work of private venture capital, not through direct allocation by the state, but through creation of an intermediate level of funds or support centers that would be administered professionally and competitively. And in the future, in the far remote horizon of transformation, what do we want? We want the market economy not to be pinned to a single version of itself. So we can imagine as a thought experiment a system under which the, res the productive resources of society belong to society. And under a set of impersonal rules, not governmental discretion, whatever group of workers and technicians or producers can assure society of the highest rate of return for the use of those resources will get to use those resources temporarily. Property will not be eternal. It will be temporary and conditional. And the productive resources of society will be accessed through what, in effect, uh, in, in, in effect, amounts to an ongoing auction. Now, of course, it has to be organized. And there have to be many intermediate levels and standards. But you see the idea. The basic form of public finance ceases to be taxation, and it becomes the charge that the state makes for the use of these productive resources, the underlying rate of interest. And then we have a completely different conception of the market. Would it be less decentralized? No, it would be more decentralized. More decentralized. But it would be more decentralized through the means of making the property right temporary and conditional, rather than allowing it to be eternal and unconditional. We would sacrifice the absoluteness of the control to the absolute level of economic decentralization. And we would radicalize, in the interest of production and of democracy, the logic of the market itself against the present form of market institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, um, of the grand examples 
took place under FDR, back to the robust liberalism of that day in the middle of multi, multiple crises with the Glass-Steagall Act. Pressure from trade union movement, pressure from leftist organizations, calls for connecting bank activities to common good and public interest. So you separate investment banks from commercial banks. You cut back on speculation. You keep track of greedy bankers and avaricious financiers that generate unbelievable levels of profit for private gain as the public good is being starved in terms of people having access to food and education and jobs with a living wage and so forth. Now, unfortunately, that act, as we, as we know, was undone under Clinton. And that was under Clinton's smart folk, and my dear brother Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, and the others. We've got to dissolve this connection. Who was calling for it? Exxon and company. Whole host of elites saying, we can generate unbelievable technological innovation if we allow these banks to speculate. Technological innovation in and of itself is not a justification for a contribution to common good. It's a beautiful thing. We do need it. But it's under certain aegis. It's under certain vision. You see. And unfortunately, that resulted in the unleashing of speculation, the unleashing of the greed, the unleashing of the avarice, avaricious activities. Let me, let me just qualify this. Uh, yes, yes, else. yes. Is that to say I'm the partly problem, wrong? But, no, no. The problem, oh, okay. <laughs> the problem is not the speculative element in finance itself. Mm -hmm. Financial speculation can be useful to society mm -hmm. in developing information and in organizing the allocation of risk. The problem is the dis disassociation mm -hmm. of the speculative element in finance from production, from the real economy. That's the problem. That's the problem. Would you say common good and public interest too? Yes, because okay. the common interest Absolutely. lies in the development production, of our production. productive power. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so I think it's a mistake to turn this into a campaign against speculation. It's a campaign against the estrangement of finance from production. Or against speculation in its present form. Speculation estranged from production. Which is what is, <laughs> but it, that's what the present form is now. It's not tied to production now. In its vast majority. In, yeah. in its dominant form. In its vast majority. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but I think that the, this, this may seem to you a minor analytical distinction. No, it's not. But it's very, very important. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, because if, if we want radical experimentalism in both politics and economics, we cannot suppress speculation. Spec experimentalism is inseparable from speculation. The, the, the problem is what kind of speculation yeah, absolutely. and under what terms. Absolutely. Under whose aegis, production, common good, public interest. That's one of the reasons why, uh, um, I mean, I was blessed to be asked to be on the Democratic Platform Committee with Brother Bernie Sanders. And one of the things we pressed, and we actually won, we, this is one of the things we won, was Glass-Steagall being reaffirmed. We only won three. There's only five of us on the whole committee pushing in that direction. And Barbara, Sister Barbara Lee on the Democratic side. Then there were 12 Clintonites against us. But we won on that, you see. Why? Because it was clear that this dominant form of speculation was tied to private gain above rather than production and common good and public interest below. You see. And this is a, a certain kind of moral and, moral and political awakening. People begin to see and perceive there's just got to be some means by which common interest and public good can be accented and elevated in the context of the financial activities of a country. That's part of the democratizing. That's very important, very much so. But yes, question. So, and, and therefore what? So I'm just wondering, how, you were saying that you think that the key to, to um, action is through, Louder. through fragmented and um, yes. 
but 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 yes, but remember remember the method that I'm using in this sequence of propositions. For each proposition, I'm describing something close, something within the horizon of the adjacent possible, like these negative and positive measures that I mentioned at the outset. And then I'm describing something that's far away. So th they're not in the adjacent possible, by definition. They're far away. So as, as opposed to what I was doing before in the previous classes, which was focusing on the middle level, the middle zone. Uh, and here, it's as, as it were, I'm trying to mm. combine the practical and the prophetic, just to show that what really matters is the direction and that it's a sequence. So I'm not supposing that we could jump to this radical future in one big step with the same exchange we had before in this question about total reconstruction. But it's very important to understand where. Where? Because as Montesquieu says, no wind helps us if we don't know what port we're sailing to. So we have to have at least a provisional conception of the direction, even though we will change it as we go along. Mm -hmm. But it's also true we have no real control over the dynamic of either the incremental or the revolutionary. We have no control. That, you know, in 1770, people sitting around here in Cambridge talking about, I think we ought to overthrow the British Empire. Get off the crack pipe, you must be kidding. Look at all these soldiers, look at all these elites, look at the, lo the loyalty that our fellow citizens have to the Brits. They, we have the chance of a snowball in hell. You know, in 1850s, abolitionists. I think we ought to overthrow white supremacist slavery. What? Crucial role in the economy? Unbelievable power to slaveholders? You know, most of the presidents, slaveholders. Most of the folk on the Supreme Court for the first 61 years, slaveholders. What makes you think these people had the capacity to overthrow something so deeply entrenched? Now, I mean, both cases, war. We're trying to move in a nonviolent direction. That's what's incremental, you see. But it's not as if you can ever impose any kind of constraint on both vision and the capacity of things that have a dynamic of their own to lead toward change, but they always don't lead toward the change you want. So we could have lost the Civil War. The Brits could have, could, could have suffocated the revolutionaries here. And I would say the same thing about patriarchy in 1920, 1960s, same thing about breaking the back of American apartheid in the 60s. You're never going to break the back of American apartheid in Mississippi. They've been lynching black folk every, every week for the last 70 years. Well, we're going to try. You know, what else can we do? That's, that's all we have to, to work with. We just hope that you minimize as much as you can any kind of terroristic act of killing innocent people or any kind of irresponsible act of doing things that would, what, that would solicit the kind of crushing of the powers that be upon those who are engaging insurgents. Six propositions. Oh, yeah. Taxation, <laughs> taxation and inequality. So here's something with which uh, many of you will for sure not agree. Uh, <laughs> the American progressives almost universally pay homage to progressive taxation, even though uh, they know or they should know that progressive taxation has only a marginal effect at best on inequality. To change inequality deeply, there's only one way to go. To intervene in the institutional arrangements that define the primary distribution of advantage and opportunity. If you attempt merely to correct after the fact, through taxation and entitlements, you can't go very far without deranging the economy. And that fact is represented in the traditional rhetoric of a tension between equity and efficiency. The real role of public spending, as illustrated by the example of the European social democracies, <coughs> 
is to maintain a high level of investment in people and in their capability. That's why you need a high tax take. But now comes a surprise revealed by the comparison of the European social democracies to the United States. The Europeans take in at least 10% of GDP more in taxes than the Americans. And they take it in largely on the basis of the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, especially through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or some functional equivalent to it. The American progressives insist on progressive taxation. Uh, but they acquiesce in a much lower tax take than the Europeans. From the standpoint of public investment in people and their capabilities, what matters in the short term is not the progressive profile of the tax system. It is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. Mm -hmm. And that is the practical secret of European social democracy. Everything that's lost by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side is gained in double on the spending side. To maximize the tax take while minimizing the economic disturbance of taxation, the derangement of incentives to invest, save, and employ, it is necessary in an initial stage to rely heavily on the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. That's the only way to do it. Because this tax is a neutral tax, neutral in relation to the system of relative prices, and therefore not subversive of the market in its present order. Uh, now, that's not how the American progressives think. They sacrifice transformative effects to political pieties. And they then genuflect to these principles of progressive taxation. Once you reorganize the tax system on this basis, a high level of tax stake based on regressive taxation, then you can go forward to progressive taxation in, a, in, 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 in the next period. For example, you can tax on a steeply progressive rate individualized consumption, the difference between the total income of the individual, not just from labor, but from capital, and invested saving. And you can say, at the lowest level, the, the taxpayer pays nothing. He receives. Then, at a higher level of standard of living, he begins to pay on a steeply progressive scale. And at the highest level, the sky's the limit. It depends on political power and will. The income tax has a maximum rate of 100%. The individualized consumption tax has no maximum rate. You could say at the highest level, for every dollar you spend in luxury level, you pay four to the state, 400%. If they were really serious about redistribution through progressive taxation, this is what they would propose. So there has to be a revolution in thinking about mm. the tax take and progressive taxation. It doesn't happen in the United States. Because in the United States, the conservatives want a flat tax with a low tax take. And the progressives want progressive taxation and would prefer a higher tax take, but they don't really fight for it. This is just for the adjacent possible. It's not for the future. Because for the future, taxes might be replaced altogether by the alternative form of public finance that I described in the earlier proposition. But how do you account for that kind of American parochialism when it comes to reflection on tax and regressive uh, consumption tax? Well, it's, 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 it's a long story because the, mm. Europeans, mm. the Europeans then developed this social compact, mm -hmm. the European social democracy, uh, that provided for a very high level of public services. Right, right. No conservative government in any major European country has ever been able to significantly lower the tax take because the vast majority of the population 
including the constituents of the right-wing parties, support it. Because it has an exchange that's high level of public services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah. the American evolution was completely different. And because the progressives lack a structural program, it seems that they use their genuflection to progressive taxation as a way of masking the absence of the structural program, as a proxy for the structural program that they don't have. That's not the way to think of it. You can't achieve, I, I insist, equality through taxation, uh, except indirectly, that is, to the extent that in a, a high level of investment in people diminishes inequality. You want to diminish inequality? Deal with the structure through the initiatives addressed in the previous three propositions. But you can see how um, right-wing brothers and sisters could take what you just said and say, let's downplay progressive taxation and go with regress regressive consumption and then argue that it's going to hit the working class. It's going to hit the working class. It's going to hit the middle class. How do you respond to that kind because of uh, the argument? essential point in this, in, uh -huh. in the proximate step, right. is the raising of the tax state. It's, very, mm. it's a mm. very simple proposition. There's no progressive alternative in the United States. There's no serious progressive alternative that can be based on the present tax take. The present tax take in the United States is incompatible with any significant progressive alternative. The state has to be refinanced. And it has to be refinanced in a way that doesn't disrupt the economy. That's the simple proposition. Uh, and that requires the Americans to accept a much higher tax take mm. than they don't. just get locked in. And then you got tax evasion. You know, Cayman Islands, and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars sitting there. You, you can't gain access to it anyway. But even if we could, you're arguing, it's still within the narrow parochial context. Question, comment? Yes. Was all of these things minimum and maximum wages to play in the destruction of those pieces? Mm, wonderful question. Uh, they can play a subsidiary role, right? Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a central instrument of economic transformation. But it's an interesting accessory initiative. There, you know, there's, there's a long historical debate about the minimum wage. And on the whole, I think its effects are, 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 are positive. And there is as well now a debate and an experience uh, in some of these European social democracies in imposing restraints on the higher returns. The technical complication, of course, is that at the top level, the major return is not in the form of wages, but quasi-wages, as in stock options. So those would have to be disciplined. But it seems to me very unlikely that such a transformation could take place in isolation. It would have to be, it would be part of this larger sequence. And in that sequence, then it becomes, it becomes thinkable and useful. You know, the, the mm. problem, mm. going back to our argument about the New Deal, mm -hmm. is, when, is when we begin to think that transformation consists in a collection of gimmicks. And like there, there's, a, there's a, 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 a bag of three or four policies that we can use. It's not like that. It's, it's, this, it's this current. Uh, I, I described it as a, as, as a waterfall. And all the particular instruments are defective and transitory. It doesn't matter. What matters is the fecundity of the movement going in a particular direction. But just in relation to that briefly, what's fascinating to me is the intensity of the opposition of workers' movements to try to increase minimum wage. Now, we go back to Seattle and other places. You would have thought that we had just re resurrected Lenin, uh, given the level of intensity of critiques, Wall Street Journal and others, something's at stake in their view that the increase these minimum wages is somehow a move toward workers' power or workers somehow 
gaining access to something they don't deserve, or with something going on there, given the intensity. Now it's normalized. You know, people call for fifteen dollars. Oh yes, we, we, we're doing it. We got major uh, oligopolies, and monopolies doing it now. Just ten, fifteen years ago, it was fringe issue. So there's something about the intensity of the opposition that needs to be considered when we talk now, about now, something further. It's very important. Mm -hmm. I'm not intending to defend European social democracy against the American path, because institutionally conservative social democracy, which is what exists is unable to solve any of the major structural problems of the European societies. Mm -hmm. social de the social democratic compromise was based on a retreat from the attempt to reshape the worlds of production and of power. And in exchange for this retreat, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate intensively, to redistribute through retrospective tax and transfer, and to manage the economy countercyclically. That's the social democratic compromise. And no important problem of the European societies, such as this hierarchical segmentation of mm -hmm. the economy, can be resolved or even addressed within the limits of the social democratic compromise. Nevertheless, the great historical achievement of European social democracy was to establish a high level of investment in people, paradoxically based on the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. Of consumption. And that's what led to this mm -hmm. sixth proposition. One last question before we move to the next proposition. But it's not inherent in the technology. The, 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 but, no, but this is crucial. The technology is entirely indeterminate in its social and economic consequences. It depends on how we organize things. So artificial intelligence is, in principle, the most revolutionary technology that has ever existed. And uh, we can imagine it being used, for example, to revolutionize education and to allow for individualized instruction well, of you know, Professor, the last thesis beginning of the American Article Society is that human organisms tend to be pretty like that power to say this is mine, I got this yeah. my mm. my own merits, I work for this, this is the American progress and you know in full form here. How are you gonna stop somebody from putting that shit? Because in? because because ultimately the way we organize the market will determine, through the regime of property, the control of assets. And ultimately, that has to be transformed, as in the example <laughs> I gave before. But not transformed at the outset. We have to imagine a, a, a sequence that can get there through, through an earlier set of steps that involve economic empowerment combined with educational empowerment. And then these further institutional changes become accessible. Mm. Well, I share you, the fears that you have. I think that's a very, very challenging question. I would simply say we already have a version of that now. These nepotistic networks, patronage, that's just a symbolic chip. See what I mean? 
that's, that's, that's part and parcel of who has access, what, how we define persons who are qualified, so forth and so on. And these are complicated issues because we know that there are such things as qualifications. We're not pushing that aside. But how do you ensure that the talented wherever, reservations, hood, barrios, working class, as well as you know, ruling class sites in Connecticut, they all ought to have fair assets right, across the board. But that chip will force us to have to wrestle with that bullet in a, in a, in a way that's already, I think, at work. Is that, is, that a, is that a fair characterization? You, you, you see where I'm headed there? So to approach the same question in, in, a, in a different vocabulary, uh -huh. whenever there is a technological and organizational innovation, a wave of innovations, mm -hmm. the most probable expression of that wave is that it will be, it will be assimilated in the form that least disturbs the ruling interests and the established ideas. That's what, mm. that's what you could call the path of least resistance. So the path of least resistance is always the most probable outcome, mm. but it's never the necessary outcome. So thought mm -hmm. and politics, mm -hmm. transformative practice, and imagination are to create an alternative to the path of least resistance. How could the same wave of technological and in and organizational innovations be harnessed to, to democratize, to widen the empowerment, rather than to contain it. Uh, and uh, uh, that, I think, is the, is the significant answer to your question. Absolutely. Of Absolutely. Course, yeah. Absolutely. Of course. So, so the disadvantage of the enemies of the path of least resistance is that they have to propose something that doesn't exist. It's intangible, again. But they have an advantage on their side. And the advantage on their side is that the contained form, like the insular form of the knowledge economy, always leaves those innovations relatively untapped. It, they fail fully to exploit the practical productive potential of those innovations. So if you have a knowledge economy that denies the most productive practice to the majority of firms and workers, the economy will be less productive. And now there is in the United States, you know, a discourse under the label of secular stagnation that tries to naturalize the, the slowdown in the rise of productivity when it's everything but natural. There are these revolutionary technologies. And then come the, the economists like Robert Solow and say, this revolution we can find everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Why? Mm. Because mm. the majority doesn't have it. Uh, and that's then the, the opportunity, the economic and political opportunity for the enemies of the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. But this notion of American freedom having multiple meanings. And it depends on what the context is. It depends on people specifying what the con what, 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 how, how they're using and deploy. That's what I meant when I talked about the Confederacy, talking about we appeal to American freedom. And they had the historical weight. Right? It was rooted in slavery. They just said, well, we want continuity. Wall right? Street convinced the man on the street that free market. That's right. It is one in which markets not so free to hire up you go with the monopolies, right? But the same is true in terms of, you know, in the 60s. Do people have a right to discriminate against black people because they want to be free in who they choose to come through their door? Well, you got to struggle over the unambiguous meaning of American freedom. And we, we can multiply this on a whole host of, 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 of issues, but this is a very important issue to highlight so people don't think that somehow you just appeal to freedom in the broad sense and it's widely understood. You've got to really elaborate and articulate 
what you mean by the substance of this, which is a precious value for, for, for all of us in some sense, and yet at the same time when we see how it fleshes out, you say, hmm, this is not the freedom we were talking about, you don't say. Yeah. Seventh proposition. Oh. There are 10, and the last two were the most controversial, so we, we have to go to them. So the seventh proposition is about education. Mm. So this alternative is not possible <laughs> without a radical change in education. And the change in education can be represented at two levels. One is the institutional and political economic setting of education. In a country that is large, unequal, and federal, such as the United States, we must reconcile the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. Uh, the quality of education that a young person receives must not depend on the happenstance of where or to whom he is born. To reconcile national standards with local management, we need three instruments. First, we need to know what's happening, uh, a form of assessment uh, of the results. And not the results determined by some narrow conception of educational success. The results interpreted from the standpoint of the alternative pedagogic agenda that I'm going to outline. Second, we need a redistributive mechanism to take resources and even staff from richer places to poorer places. So education can't depend just on local finance. And third, we need a procedure for corrective intervention. If there's a local school system that repeatedly fails below the national standards, we need to have a trans-federal mechanism for taking it over. It's not a federal intervention. It's cooperation within the federal system among the three levels of the federation, three joint bodies that take over a failing school system temporarily, fix it, and return it fixed. Now comes the second part of the educational transformation the nature of teaching and learning. What kind of an education does this alternative require? First, it requires one that accords priority to the analytic and synthetic powers of the imagination over the encyclopedia, over information. Second, because these capacities cannot be acquired in a vacuum of content, what matters with respect to content is not coverage, but depth. Selective deepening thematically through projects rather than encyclopedic superficialities. Third, in its social setting, education should imitate advanced science. And it should be cooperative in, in teams of uh, students, teachers, and schools. And fourth, and this is the most important element, it should be, as I suggested before, dialectical. Everything should be taught at least twice from two opposing points of view. And it will be possible to teach everything twice if we sacrifice the objective of encyclopedic superficiality. Uh, now then, looking ahead into the future, to maintain the symmetry of my method. Uh, we don't want this just as initial education. We want education throughout a lifetime. And therefore, the state has to organize things to help people reinvent themselves in the course of their lives, to change careers, and to acquire new, new, new capacities. Uh, and that should then become part of the package of basic capability ensuring endowments settled on every individual citizen and worker. This ideal of the reinvention of the self mm -hmm. is a, a development of the American prophecy. 
uh, after all, all of us have to, uh, early in our lives, sacrifice a part of ourselves. We have to mutilate ourselves in order to become something in particular. And the something in particular is never adequate to a human being, because a human being can be everything. And so somehow, in that particular situation, we have to remember the missing limbs as part of the basis for our imagination of the others. And the state has to help us reinvent ourselves later on and acquire the, ed the education that makes this self-reinvention possible. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, sub-points on that proposition, though, brother. <laughs> but it's very rich. Let me just give one example. Uh, um, at the end of the Civil War, we had 4% literacy among black people. Then one generation of 70%. In the face of terror, lynching. You had the crusade, New England, tied to Pi Day and education. Colleges across the board, over 150 black colleges across the board. The intimate connection between the quest for freedom and dignity and the quest for education. When education is viewed as if, like air, it is enabling and empowering, then young people have a deep care for it. When it's viewed as something external, doesn't speak specifically to their plight and situation, they view it as something that's alien. There's a personal side of this that has to do with just people who have a profound care in the young people themselves and believe deeply in their capacity. But secondly, it has to do with a context in which joy of learning is integral to the educational process. And that joy is not reducible just to utilitarian calculus. Because if it's reducible to utilitarian calculus, which is to say, let's say being successful in money, there might be ways of gaining access to being successful in money have nothing to do with education. There's a long tradition of that in America. So that when we talk about pedagogy, you know, we're really talking about all these different levels. Now, of course, you must have the resources. Of course, you must make sure that people have the quality textbooks and so forth and so on. But at this deeper level of civic virtue, ties to public interest again. 1916, John Dewey's Democracy in Education. He says it more eloquently than anybody that I know. When you get the examples of the black woman clubs saying our fundamental aim in part is going to be the spreading of kindergartens in every community, the spreading of high quality elementary schools in every community, and our civic associations will be extensions, the churches and so forth. That's how to be Wells Barnett. That's Josephine St. Pierre right here in Boston. Educators in crusade tied to care and so forth. Now, in terms of being dialectical and so on, I know it's getting late, you got other propositions. But the, uh, um, uh, that's, a, that's another conversation, though, because um, I think you need more than just two sides. As many as possible. Oh, yeah, OK, that's cool. <laughs> I said at least two. Uh, you said at least two. Oh, I missed that, at least. OK. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Eighth proposition, democracy. All the democracies that exist in the world are weak democracies, including American democracy. They're weak in the sense that they inhibit rather than facilitate the political transformation of the social and economic order. They perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead. And they make change depend on crisis. So the rule in these weak democracies is no, no ruin, no transformation. Economic collapse or military conflict is the, as the enabling circumstance of wider change. Uh, to create a high energy democracy that overthrows the rule 
of the living by the dead and diminishes the dependence of change on crisis. We need three sets of innovations in the American context. They have equipment throughout the world. So I'm going to cite them in the inverse order of what seems to me to be their immediate feasibility in the United States, going from the proximate to the more, from in this case, from the remote to the, to the proximate. I'm inverting the order. So first, in the constitutional arrangements of the government, we need constitutional arrangements that no longer perpetuate impasse between the political branches of government. There are two principles in the American Constitution. The liberal principle of the fragmentation of power and the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. Madison scheme. And what we should want is to affirm the liberal principle but rid ourselves of the conservative one. How? By many instruments. For example, by saying, when there is an impasse between the political branches, either of them could resolve the impasse by calling early elections. But the elections would always be bilateral for both branches, so that the branch that exercised the constitutional prerogative would have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. The objective is to accelerate politics. The second set of innovations has to do with the level of, of organized popular engagement in political life. If we want a quicker politics, we also want a high temperature politics, political mobilization. The premise of conservative political science and statecraft is that there is a choice between a cold institutional politics and a hot anti-institutional politics that you have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. But it's not true. You can have a politics that's hot and institutional at the same time, elevating the level of popular political engagement through the electoral regimes, through the public financing of political campaigns, and through the access in favor of the political parties and the mass movements to the means of mass communication. Free access as a condition of their, of their revocable licenses, which are given by the state. Uh, now, the third set of innovations has to do with the relation between central initiative and deviation within the country. The whole advantage of a federal system, which unitary states can imitate, is to allow parts of the country to secede from the general solution and develop counter models of the national future. So long as the deviation is not used to entrench the prerogatives of some particular part of society. There has to be control, judicially and politically. Now, what's the right sequence in the United States? I have the impression that the American progressives want to begin with the second set of innovations, those having to do with the temperature, money and politics, media and politics. Mm -hmm. But the natural place to begin is with the third set of innovations, because the experimentalist use of federalism has wide appeal in the United States and comes naturally to the American political temperament. That's the place to begin. And from there, then, to the second set of innovations about the raising of the temperature, and only at the end to the sacrosanct constitutional arrangements of the United States. Mm -hmm. I was getting late. Maybe we should jump right in. We only got five minutes here. Questions, queries? Shall I just state? Cornell, the last two. Last two, or did you want to save the two for the end of, of what? the class? 
the end of the class. We're at the end of the class. Well, no, I'm talking about the last session because we no. got dialogue. We want to hold. No, we'll get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Right quick. Right quick. Okay. So uh, the ninth proposition is about the integrationist orthodoxy in the United States, the relation of race and class. So these two last propositions are the so-called wedge issues. They're the issues that make it difficult to develop a transracial progressive majority. They divide the potential constituency. Mm -hmm. So the first is race and class. The integrationist orthodoxy treats race as a threshold issue, separating race from class. Unlike the brief experiment of the Freedmen's Bureau right after the Civil War, which in some way tried to combine race and class, it was then suppressed mm -hmm. by the central government and from the North. So uh, what does it do? Take the example of affirmative action. It separates the black elite from the black underclass. It generates benefits that are in inverse proportion to the need for them. More the black bourgeoisie than the black working class, and more the black working class than the black underclass, which is left behind. And it offends the white working class majority <clears throat> of the country, which regards themselves as the victims of a conspiracy between the self-appointed leaders of the minorities and these and the liberal political leadership. But what's the alternative? The alternative is to distinguish radically between individualized racial discrimination, <clears throat> which could be even criminalized, as it is in many countries, and the collective promotion of groups that find themselves caught in a circumstance of disadvantage and exclusion from which they are unable to escape by the means of collective action that are available to them. So those circumstances are likely to be defined always by some combination of forms of disadvantage, beginning with the combination of race and class. And for them, we need policies of active promotion distinct from the issue of individualized racial discrimination. Then we have a basis to separate, not no longer to separate questions of racial oppression from questions of economic injustice. Now, the 10th proposition, which has to do with the moral agenda, the other great wedge issue, mm -hmm. the issue mm -hmm. of division. So, uh, there's a conflict of moral agendas in the United States. The so-called secular or, or modernist agenda against the so-called religious or traditionalist agenda. The liberals in power, the progressives, have tried to entrench by constitutional interpretation and federal law one of these agendas against the other. The truth is that they're both primitive, spiritually, morally, uh, and that the attempt to entrench them has backfired on the progressives by offending the white working class majority of the country, a great part of it, religious, and allowing conservative statecraft to develop its formula of power in the United States, which is to combine material concessions to the money classes with moral accommodation to the classes without money. Uh, and this, this is a fundamental mistake of the progressives on this view. They should abandon this attempt to entrench one agenda and the other and allow the states under the American Constitution to take their separate ways. Now, this raises an issue. The, the most salient issue is, is abortion, the contemporary equivalent to the divisive issue of prohibition earlier in American constitutional history. Women who are in states 
that would deny abortion would then have to be to go and to be financed to go to states that permit abortion. And what are Americans best at? The practical ingenuity to organize that kind of thing. So there is no obstacle. And the whole activity of this, of this movement within the country in the context of a perpetuation of the moral conflict rather than its suppression would contribute then to the, mm. not just to the emancipation of the American people, but to their enlightenment. But why wouldn't women in Texas, poor, middle class, ruling class, whatever, have the same rights to abortion as a woman in New York? Or why would she have to because jump on a plane and go all a, the way to New York? The question that's presented in American law mm. and in the interpretation of the American Constitution mm. is whether, as a matter of law, and of constitutional interpretation, one of these agendas is already in the Constitution. Now, a foreigner who reads the American Constitution doesn't find any of these agendas in them. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte recommended that a Constitution should be brief and obscure. And the only country that followed his advice before the fact was the United States. And, uh, so what, what has happened in the United States because of the cult of the Constitution is that the characteristic way in which Americans change the Constitution is not to change it, but to reinterpret it. And so they pretend to find all these rights in them. But it's much better to change the Constitution by changing it if it's going to be changed. And, and this, this way of changing the Constitution has a tilt which it's very important to understand. It's easy or relatively easy to protect